Good morning. This is Ellen calling in from the beautiful island of St. Bart's, and you are listening to Light Talk. Well, hi, this is Stan in Gainesville, Florida, and today we're going to be discussing daylight sensors, stage hand standards, and the MyMix Color app, all on Light Talk. Hey, this is Steve coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk, and we are the Lumen Brothers. And sister. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, but you're lying about Long Beach there, buddy. I'm calling Bupkis on Long Beach. Long Beach is Long Beach is in California right now. And as you know, David is not here today. He is out playing hooky with his best friend, and, and that's why Ellen's with us today. Law- and lawyer. So, you know, I took this opportunity to uh, break into his house. I'm out here because I was worried a little bit about the mosquito-eating pig. Uh, you know, if you remember, he has a Tesla and he has a pig that rides along with him to draw mosquitoes to it. So today, when we finish, the pig and I, <laughs> Robert, or as I call him, Bob, we're going to start the day at Rosie's Dog Park. Then we're going to go to the aquarium and we're going to go down to the Swan Boat Ride, all things to do in Long Beach. And we're going to end the day at Sophie's Restaurant. David tells me his pig likes curry noodles. <laughs> so someone's got to take care of the pig while David's out playing. So that's that's somebody's got to somebody's got to edit this show. Is that David's you, David? going to edit the show? He is willing to do that, but he doesn't want to be interrupted. He wants to have a pleasant afternoon. We just got to talk about David for the obligatory three minutes, so he feels included. So, do we have any news that's happening in the industry? I got some news. There's a couple of events coming up that people might be interested in. Uh, January 18 to 20 is the live production summit in Palm Springs, California formerly called TourLink, which basically covers the touring side of things, uh, from technology to health and wellness on tour. And info can be found at liveproductionsummit.com. And following that is NAM, uh, January 25th to 28th in Anaheim, which can be found at nam.org, N-A-M-M.org, which includes training and technology, as well as the Parnelli Awards for the live events industry. Um, so those are two great events. And if I wasn't stuck in the tropics, I'd head to California for the rest of the month. Stuck in the tropics? Yeah, is well, that you know. Is that how you re- refer to it now? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting <laughs> way to say well, it. Well, you know, I don't get um, the live production summit or NAM here, so I'd have to go somewhere. You just get these gorgeous sunsets. I'm looking at the yes. picture behind you. Yeah, we do get beautiful. gorgeous sunsets. But, you know, if you're looking for a good dose of industry information, head to Anaheim and Palm Springs in January. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Ellen, I think you have our first question today. I do. John from Denver has asked if anyone has used the Color My Mix app from Roscoe, what you think of it, and is it useful and color correct to save and share colors? Anybody used it? <laughs> Anybody know anything about it? Well, I, he stumped well, you. He stumped the experts. Who is this? Who, who is this person? John from Denver. He's a lighting designer, and he has seen the press about the MyMix Color app. And if you open the Roscoe website, it pops right up. And uh, I guess you guys haven't explored it yet. You're not teaching your kids how to use it. I, I'm aware of it. Let's say that I, I don't use it that way. So you're a good man, John. I, I use my mix book. In a different way. I use it for pre-production purposes. So for me, you know, how many times as a lighting designer have you gone to those early meetings and you just sit there while the model is being shown by the set designer and all the costume sketches and are being shown and all the stuff that's very tangible is out there. And then it becomes your turn and either it's technical or it's so abstract, no one knows what you're talking about unless you just happen to have a really great director sitting around with you. So for me, my mix book, what I found it extremely useful for is to put color on the model, to put color on the costume fabric. It's a great way to discuss color with the director. Um, You know, I start day one when the director says, I want, I don't know, a red sunset. We can look at some stuff there and things that he or she thinks they might want. I can save it. So it becomes kind of a, a, a build a folder for possible things to explore once I'm in the theater. So I'm, I'm using it that way. So I have played with it. I have a mix book. I have the app. I see what it does. 
Um, I think what Steve just described would be useful. You know, I probably should take a look at it again because I'm teaching a, a intro, a very basic lighting course this semester. I haven't taught that in 25 years. And so I guess it does sort of substitute for a swatch book. It's a, certainly more interactive than a swatch book and a flashlight um, and because it does the whites as well. So, yeah, I, I, think, I think it's a good tool. Let me I ask think you a question a about this. Do, do you, like Roscoe, of course, was a leader in the gel industry. And the numbers are very famous, Roscoe 80, Roscoe, you know, whatever your favorite Roscoe gel is. Does the My Mix Color app mix things to match those gel numbers, or are they just history at this point? Yeah, I think it does. I think you can. I know that, well, for, I don't know if, I can't be sure, but I know in EOS, you can select with their colors. They have multiple ways of selecting color. But I think you can get diminishing returns on this stuff. It's sort of like the old days where, oh, you know, you can buy this television, it does 16.9 million colors as a marketing piece. It doesn't matter because your eye cannot make, detect these, all these differences uh, that, you, that, that the science can create for you. And in fact, I'll tell you a little, a little story. I did a project at Smithsonian uh, that was a David Hockney work that was lit with Verilite VL5s. And, it, and because it was David Hockney and because it was Smithsonian, color matching was key. So we actually did very intense spectroscopy measurements on what the color was, bouncing off this multicolored artwork with color changing light. It was a groundbreaking piece of fine art. And the concern was to really honor that work. So we're going to now put LEDs in. And what's the actual color? So we did the measurements, and we sent the measurements to ETC, and they made us a custom EOS build with those colors. So then, we, so then when we put the light on using a, a new LED fixture, mathematically, scientifically, it was a perfect match numerically. But you know what? It didn't look that way to our eyes. So we, had to go, so, so we went back and we just mixed it ourselves. So I think there's sort of a, you can get a level of minutia with this stuff about matching, honestly, and, and color is low resolution anyway. Intensity is high resolution vision. So I think it's a useful tool for sure, like the way Steve described it, but I think you can get a little crazy about, oh, I've got to have this exact color and it's got to be to the nanometer. I think you can get carried away. Well, what about saving them once you've mixed them? Is this where you do that? Yes, you can do that. Yeah, I'm looking at Roscoe's sure. site can... right now, and uh, they say it is a one-to-one -one match with 130 Roscoe gel colors. Um, but I, 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 I'm not convinced. Maybe I'm just not sophisticated enough. I'm not convinced. Um, I think Stan is right. I'm not convinced about looking at the thing and trying to figure out the math numbers on the gel and then import that data into the console. I think that, I don't know. It doesn't seem like the the best use of the thing for me, but I but I but I think being able to turn that color on and put it on skin tone or something that's tangible is is very useful. And I think being able to build folders for your shows, I think that's very uh, useful. Agree with Steve. Turning light on in a meeting, colored light and transforming objects, very useful. But let me just. Uh, amplify what Steve said about the one-to-one -one match idea. You got to remember, we've talked about this before. What's the source? You're putting a gel over a what? An incandescent? Uh, and which color, what color temperature of the incandescent lamp is? Is it three thousand Kelvin? Thirty-five hundred Kelvin? Twenty-eight hundred Kelvin? What's it? It's, what's its intensity? There's too many X factors to get that into the minutia about matching. I do think that's that's useful. In Mixbook, because in Mixbook, you can do that. You can take a look at the color, your Roscoe 80, for example, and say, what does it look like if I'm putting it through 3,200 degrees or if I'm putting it through 5,000 degrees? So I think that aspect of it's kind of useful. But again, it's finding the X, Y, Z coordinates. It's numerical, right? So you can, you can just say... This, this Roscoe gel at a 3,500K source at full intensity on the XY axis is these two numbers, right? But then that's just, the, that's just in the color space on the XY. It doesn't account for the Z. 
which is the intensity. And color and, color and intensity are inextricably lit, linked in terms of the way we perceive it. So I don't know. It's cool. I think Steve's use of it is the best. Well, Stan, I think you have our second question today. Yeah, and it kind of, it kind of actually is a, a bit of a related to this question. So Nelson on Long Island says, hey, I'm doing a project that integrates theatrical, tunable white daylight and natural daylight. And I want the levels to be coordinated and respond to shifting daylight levels. How can I do that? It just so happens that I'm working on a project similar to this. And I have to integrate tunable white daylight with natural light that's coming through skylight. So if you could imagine a space about 100 feet, about maybe 14 feet tall on a curve, it's got a scrim-like material, and then it's got a, behind the scrim-like material, there's a wall, if you will, of different size holes. And the daylight comes through the hole, the daylight comes into this huge volume, and it goes through the holes, and then it creates the shape on the scrim from behind. But of course, it's not always gonna be the same weather conditions. So I wanna match the, I wanna, in other words, that environment, needs to sort of constantly be dynamic and, and working in concert with daylight. So I just learned today, in fact, a second piece. I, obviously, there's a simple answer. And, and for theater people, maybe this isn't so exciting. But for people who work in architecture, maybe it's more exciting. You can certainly measure the amount of light you have in Lux, right? And light sensors will do that. And then you can certainly, I found out today, you can also measure color temperature. Oh, so now I can have the, day, the, the tunable white co color temp adjustments and measure what's coming in from daylight and sort of match it or play against it with my theatrical white. And I can also think about what's the lowest light I ever want in this space, if it's 30 lux, let's say, or 20 lux, right? As the clouds move by and the lights from the skylights and the windows go down. But get this. This really got me excited from the, the architectural lighting guy in me. I didn't know this because I'm shopping for programmers who are really good at mosaic. I don't know if you guys know what mosaic or what Pharos. Pharos and mosaic ETC product, it's a, it's a timeline based control system rather than a Q stack system. And I found out from the programmer who I was trying to get on the project that they can take the, the brain for the control system, plug it into the internet, and they have a module, and I said hard module or soft module? No, it's software that connects it to AccuWeather. And so you're getting, maybe this is common to you guys, but I was kind of thrilled that I can have this for like no money. It's constantly telling the brain what the weather is at your condition in real time. And then you can create timelines by which, okay, it's rain, run this timeline. It's overcast, run this timeline. It's this time of day under this condition, run this timeline. And, and that's just really pretty cool. So the notion of having light that's tunable, respondent to daylight, working in concert with it, I think it's a really exciting, exciting world with all these sensors and controls that we've never had before. So, so I think if you're doing a project like that, Nelson, uh, take a look at uh, these products. It's, uh, it's a TAP41, which is an ambient photo cell that does all of these, all of these features from Echoflex, which is now an ETC company. ETC is like the, the PRG of the day. So they just bought Echoflex. And this is an Echoflex um, TAP41 that will give you daylight control and color temperature control and the, and the uh, Pharos or Mosaic will let you do the real-time weather as you move forward on a project like that. Amazing. Yeah, it is. It really is what we have at our disposal today. It's sort of bl mind blowing, right? Well, it is. And everything keeps changing so rapidly. And every time you think you're done with changes, there's another one. Yeah, and I wouldn't know how to, you know, I would have, I, I'm, I kind of knew like in the back of my head that must be there, you know, that must be available, but I've never had a project where I needed to use it. And then I realized I, I needed somebody who's not just a theatrical programmer for this project. I needed somebody who really does sort of weird stuff. Um, the, uh, this guy's name, I'll, I'll give him a shout out, is Robbie Hayes, 
who owns a company called Lumen Pixel Lab up in Alexandria, Virginia, but they work all over the country, and I'm trying to bring him on to, to help me through this. Yeah, he does like, you know, water towers, museums, um, you know, it's all, his work is really, really very interesting. Cool. And he's both a really good tech and a really good designer, both. Cool. Very cool. So, you are listening to Light Talk with the Lumen Brothers and Sister. And Light Talk is sponsored by... Hands-on training from Forklift University, LLC, of Bad Ombre Stage Productions. Do you have employees who are required to operate a forklift? Perhaps these men and women are unskilled to operate a forklift properly. If so, you have only yourself to blame for lost time accidents. Lack of proper forklift training is the number one cause of accidents. Let hands-on training from Forklift University, LLC, of Bad Ombre Stage Productions, <laughs> help you build the workforce you deserve. For only $49.95, we will send you a 12-lesson forklift training video and hands-on driving exercise guide. Let's take a look at just four of the 12 lessons. Lesson number one, the constant turning on and off of a forklift can lose valuable seconds every workday. Once you arrive in the morning, turn that forklift on and leave it running until you finish the workday. It's just common sense that if you leave a forklift running, unsupervised, someone will step up and use the thing and at the same time improve their operating skills. At worst, this practice will train the crew to keep their head on a swivel and be aware of their escape route. Lesson number four. Make your forklift training exciting with forklift racing. Those <laughs> aisleways in the arena are there for a reason. Forward or backward, it doesn't matter. Heads up or time trials. We recommend flat track racing at rodeos and ice shows. Lesson number eight. Maybe your drivers are getting a little bored during the workday. Two simple words. Forklift jousting. It's <laughs> essentially bumper cars using forklifts. Add a second hand sitting or standing on the forks with a push broom in his hand and see who will eat concrete today. Lesson 11. When all else fails, find ways to use your forklift for anything other than its intended purpose. Tow truck stage pusher into place, man lift, or even follow spot position. Use your imagination. The more bizarre, the better. Order our training course today and we will throw in a he tried to kill me with a forklift back brace. <laughs> Hands-on training from Forklift University, LLC of Bad Ombre Stage Productions. You have to learn from someone. It might as well be us. <laughs> <laughs> and now back to light talk wow that's uh yeah forklifts are really dangerous do you wanna, really really dangerous do you want to know the sad honest truth about today's sponsor i went to the osha site and those are the four <laughs> those are the four most common accident causers of forklifts if wow. you're working at an arena, if you're working at uh, the warehouse, those are the four things in order that most people get in trouble do uh, doing. Wow. I, I just can't imagine, you know, forklift racing. Okay, I, I can get behind that. But forklift <laughs> jousting? People think that's a good idea. Like, like the forks are, the, are, are like the, uh, the lance, right? Like smacking each other? Right. And sometimes they do put a person on there with a, with a push broom. <laughs> well, you know, the reality is there's a lot of them at LDI, and there are supposed to be um, freight-free aisles for them to move mm. up and down and go try and find one. You know, it's, mm. it's, uh, as the show gets, you know, closer and closer, and all that stuff is there, it's really hard for those forklift people to get around. They might just start jousting to... Survive. Have you ever had a, have you ever aware of anybody getting hurt? Well, at we did have an incident a while back where um, someone who was not authorized to use a forklift used one on a loading dock and had an accident with a stagehand's mm. foot. Oh, um, yeah. Um, it was not, you know, the guy did not lose his foot or anything, but certainly unauthorized personnel should really not use them. It's not as easy no, as you no. think. No, I bet it isn't, right? 
Even driving like a scissor lift is not as easy as you think. Yeah, and even driving that. a mobility scooter is not as easy <laughs> as you think. <laughs> Oh, driving in general, which is right. like, you know, Elon wants us all not to drive. It's going right. to be automated, now, right? Let me ask you a question. As one of the, I don't know, foundational people of LDI, I, I noticed a mobility scooter in, in your life this year. And I was wondering, uh, who gave you permission to go that fast? I mean, I would be yelling and waving at you, and you'd be down the road a hundred yards. You, you know, know I should have used started using one thirty five years ago. A couple years ago, it real I realized that nobody that works in those places walks long distances. They're all on segways or carts of some sort. Mm. Uh, you know, and when you need to go from there to registration and back to a meeting room and then back to the show office and then down to the floor, you know, you sort of need to either be the flash or have a mobility scooter. Well, I mean, I'm clearly not you, uh, but I tracked my steps as just the casual observer at LDI, mm -hmm. and I was easily doing uh, ten to 15,000 steps a day. Right, right. I mean, just wandering around without having a mission right. to run right. back and forth across the arena the way you do. Right. That's it, healthy, Steve. I was, but it all goes to Ellen's point. I mean, there, there are people who put a lot of steps in every day. Absolutely. We're supposed to put in, we're all supposed to do 10,000 a day to be healthy. I don't even know we're near that. Right. You should ask for a forklift. Right. Marion Sandberg, you know, our vice president for LDI um, and live design has a, uh, she's a, uh, she has a terrible habit. She runs iron, she does iron mans. Um, and she did one not to, <laughs> it's a great thing to do. Talk about healthy. Um, and she did one half marathon, half Ironman, not too far before LDI, and ended up with a stress fracture in her foot. So she was in a boot at LDI. So she also had a scooter. And she's like, man, I should have done this a long time ago, too. And we were <laughs> racing. Talk about, you know, forklift racing. <laughs> well, I mean, this, this, I think this leads us right into uh, our Let's Talk About. The monkeys are excited. They're getting all worked up. The iguanas. I know. Are, I have to calm them down. Shut up, guys. The iguanas are out there eating grasshoppers or something. They're just bouncing around. They, they, they're all just squealing for less talk about. And today, our less talk about is: Should stagehands be credentialed? Well, my first question about that is: Don't you have to take a test to get into the union? You know, I just, I just wanted to let you know that yesterday I had to uh, renew my driver's license. And so I go there to get my driver's license renewed, and the officer says, okay, it's time for the test. And I'm thinking, oh, crap. You know, I haven't taken a written test for a driver's license in a long time. So I'm sitting there kind of panicking, and he says, are you ready? And I go, sure. And he holds up a card, and he says, what color do you see? And I go, green. And then he holds up another card, red. You have passed the test. You are qualified to drive in the state of Texas. Oh, so dear. That was it. That, well, <laughs> you know, if I can see red and green, I'm all right. Uh, so I, I guess the question is, um, what does credentialed really mean? Mm -hmm. And then the other question Eller brings up is, what is training? And if I can throw a third one out there, who's teaching and is there any kind of national or statewide board of licensing? There's so many moving parts to credentialing a stagehand. Well, are we talking about IA stagehands or just general? Well, this originated from a, um, a student who sent this in as a question. And I would say, I mean, let's, let's start with union stagehands. Let's start with the people who are professionals, who are out there every day. That's not saying people who are working in smaller theaters are not good, but let's let's start with the union people. All right. Well, as far as I understand, they apprentice and they pass a test. I can imagine that's true in some of the bigger locals. I don't know if that's true in the uh, hundreds of locals we have across the country. To me, that's the that's the problem. I mean, it's one thing to be a stagehand in local one, and another thing to be a stagehand in a small town that does one show a month and with 12, 12 guys. But IATSE does have a huge education and training department that um, trains workers 
teaches them their crafts, their skills, safety training, uh, encourages them to take the OSHA training, works closely with the um, ETCP certification, USITT. I know um, at LDI, sometimes we have a lot of IA people teaching sessions, some of which are for IA training only, some are open to everybody. Um, So I do know um, that education is a big uh, concern for them. I have a couple thoughts. I mean, I think the, you have to kind of define credentialing or whether you want the state involved, which is one thing, which the state has a mandate to protect the public, and that's a very serious, and states take that very seriously. I mean, even down to hairstylists. A hairstylist in the state of Florida has to be licensed by the state because there's a hygiene issue. You just don't want anybody putting stuff in your hair, right, and, and with the scissor and all of that stuff. On the other hand, the unions, as Ellen's pointing out, I think have a sort of a self-determined mandate, if you will, to to self-police their own members. If they want to be respected and 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 be able to come to the bargaining table and, and demand certain benefits and, and salaries, uh, to be able to say our people know what they're doing and we take education and training and keeping our our members up to date makes perfect sense. Uh, when you get into like state licensure or, or credentialing, that's a different ball of wax. So like, for example, and I think there's a different level. If we talk about doctors, lawyers, engineers that have to get architects. a state licensure. Yeah, architects. Here's the here's what I've learned from working with those guys is because the state has a this obligation to the public, meaning everybody in the country or in the state, those guys have a recognition that that license that they get is a is a ticket to a to a salary, right? That so in other words, they don't. when you hire an engineer or an architect, you think you're hiring them. Yes and no, because they have another sort of authority they answer to besides the guy that's paying their check for one project. It's the state. So the state carries the power to remove your license, which is basically ending your career. So that's a, there's a certain sort of level of um, what's at stake when you're state licensed, Right, and even a hairdresser, for that matter, you stick the combs and not and, and don't keep them clean, right? And the scissors proper, you start to spread germs. I mean, there's the reasons you want s- certain professions to have state licensure. Stagehands, I don't know. It seems to me that the unions are doing a pretty good job of self policing themselves. We don't have. I, I remember reading somewhere that our industry, d- considering the level of danger. Back to its forklifts, <laughs> forklifts excluded. But the level of, of damage that could happen in our industry does not happen that much. And that the sense that we actually do self police ourselves in terms of training and safety fairly well. So I don't know, I'll just put that out there. Well, you know, I mentioned ETCP and they do train and certify um, electricians um, as well as riggers, arena riggers, and entertainment riggers. And um, one assumes that it's pretty rigorous to become certified, and then they have to take continuing education to get those ETCP renewal credits, um, a certain number in a certain time period. So that's um, another one of the self-policing sort of areas that we do do. Yeah, it's good. And OSHA has that 30-hour safety training thing. Although I do have to say that, you know, sometimes you go to a big rock and roll concert, and at the end, there's like teams of technicians in color coded t-shirts who like start climbing the the trussing and everything to start taking things apart and they're not wearing hard hats and they're not necessarily um harnessed and you wonder like what's going on here that's a little scary well i have heard that uh in some in some aspects of our industry i don't have this firsthand they they have, have a hard time finding train people, good train, train stagehands. They just pull people in off the street and say, come to work. And I want to pick up and amplify something that you said about ETCP, which I support. We put, we put ETCP 
rigors on all of our specifications for the installers on all of our jobs right now. But I want to say, you mentioned something called con- their CUs, continuing education units. And this might be something our industry could maybe adopt more broadly, even in architecture, right? If, in order for an architect to maintain their state licensure, right, in certain states, they have to... Uh, uh, accrue a certain number of continuing education units every year, which keeps them pr- uh, current, you know. And in fact, that's what we were trying to do with, Steve and I were talking yesterday about why UF at LDI failed. But but in a sense, we don't really have a situation where people in our industry are required, ATCP is, is voluntary, to get CUs to continue their education and to stay sharp across their career. Right, but like in the architectural lighting side, there's the NCPLQ, yes. um, and they yeah. have to, but the, in our industry, there's no, like LDI cannot offer continuing education credits because there's nothing to offer them for or against or to support. Well, I know even if you want to teach, like I've been asked to teach some things for for AIA, for C, CUs, and the, the it's a fairly... It's not that heavy, but you have to. But the person doing the teaching has to have some credibility, you know, in transferring in transferring that knowledge. But they have a but they have a a, a criteria to cre- to something to certify as a CU. Well, but right. I don't know what but that for would like need LDI, to be. you would not have like a rigging course taught by someone who was not an ETCP certified rigger. And we you try wouldn't. to get the right. ones that are not only certified, but that are the what they call the. Um, SMEs, the subject matter experts, uh, who came up with the testing and the criteria for those credits in the first place. Well, you know, it sounds like maybe something like uh, ESTA could develop a program similar to what AIA has. ESTA AIA developed ETCP. The, well, they did, right. But I'm saying that, that, that to create these continuing education units that people can get, but but with AIA, this, you have the state involved. The state says if you want to make, keep your architecture license, you're going to need so many CUs every so often. Right. We don't really have anything akin to that in our industry no. is what I'm putting out there. But entertainment lighting designers are not state certified. Well, you know what? Architectural lighting designers are not either. And there has been a mo- but electrical engineers are, of course. And there has been some movement in that field I think there was an uh, there was a, a movement in Texas. I think Steve uh, to try and get architectural line designers license, state licensure, right? Uh, be, because of the because of people complaining that they get there's a lot of people who were let's say gently are hacks, and it frustrates construction people because these guys don't really know what they're doing, and, and uh, that but that I don't know what the, what the state of that. And that would be something that IES would sort of push forward. So I don't know where it comes from in our industry, but I think it's a worthy conversation. Well, I think this circles back um, to the people climbing trusses um, in the yellow T-shirts. I, I, my experience with the IEA is they have been very good to a limit, and that limit is their core membership. So you go into a small town somewhere and there are 12 men and women in the local and they're pretty good. And then all of a sudden a show comes in that needs 25 people and now they're scrambling. And I I think most of the horror stories that I have are with the people in the yellow t-shirts, the box pushers, not uh, who are never going to vertically move in that, in the local. They are there simply as, as, laborers over hire. Yeah. yeah. I think that's where our problem is. Right. Mm-hmm. And on the stage hand, um, Facebook page, sometimes it says, you know, six hands needed tomorrow night, Atlanta, Georgia must be yeah. local. No travel of, you know, no travel payment, you know, allowed or provided. So they really are trying to get local people and they just clearly don't have enough in some cases. That sounds like a problem with a very difficult solution in a country that's, you know, we're still a little bit of the Wild West, you know. Well, I'm looking at, uh, and also it's it's our mentality. I'm looking at a website right now that's fairly easy to find if you're a stagehand and you're looking for a job. And, you know, the first, and I won't go into who these employers are, but it might surprise you. You know, here's one that says uh, qualifications. You must be able to leave uh, to lift 50 pounds 
lots of moving of boxes around. Assembly of stage lighting, assembly of stage audio. Uh, you know, when I look down this list, there's only one here who actually calls out some serious skills. All the rest of them are you know, your duties, your, your, your stuff. It all comes here. Ability to clean up after the show is important. I mean, who writes this? Who puts this in a, <laughs> in a, in a job listing for a stagehand? You know, well, the ones that don't want you to finish and say, okay, I'm done, punch out and off I go. And everything's right. like uncoiled and unput back. Right. So I know, you know, here in Florida, we have a lot of venues. And um, let me give an example that Steve was sort of describing earlier, where you have a crew that does the 10 or, the 10 or 12 people, uh, but, you're, but then a big show comes in and you've got to supplement the labor. We have a, a facility that we built down in the villages, which is a large retirement community, has a core crew. And for most events, they can handle it locally. But when they get a bigger show, they need additional hands. And they have found a stagehand service company out of Orlando. I don't know which one it is, AV Nation or Stage Crew Jobs. There's a bunch of these things that I guess do some training. And they send these, these people up when they need a uh, Overhire essentially, and they've been really, really happy with the outcome. Now, that's maybe in Florida, which is sort of an entertainment state, but if you're in, I don't know, Idaho, it might be different. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it gets back to, you know, this idea of apprenticeship. Who are you apprenticing with? What does that person, your, what does your mentor bring to the training? Um, you know, again, I, Another, another listing here for stagehands. Um, must be able to put up signs and banners, sweeping the stage between shows, run errands, make adjustments whenever necessary. I mean, they're, they're looking, this is, it feels like, you know, they have driven by the kind of um, shaping up area and they're just looking for 12 guys to get on the truck and, and come help roof that day. Well, that's and, sort of Teamsters, right? Like Teamsters do that, truck loaders, you know. <laughs> I, well, I think I'd rather hire a Teamster than um, just some person at the bus stop. But it, you right. know, there, I think where we get into trouble maybe is not the IA. Maybe it's everyone else. Well, the IA maybe is Ellen, Teamsters, aren't they? No, but maybe Ellen's right. Maybe uh, when we started this question, who are we talking about? It's not the IA we need to be talking about. It's, it's the people who who can't get into the union, who are, who unions aren't available in their area. It's these people who have, uh, you know, worked hard in high school or have some college training and now they're out there and they're trying to make a career and it's, you know, train yourself or get fired off the job. And that's, that's a lonely place to be. I'll, I'll just, you know, I saw a, a stagehand standing on an arbor once, uh, trying to load bricks on another arbor that was, little too high to get from the deck and i thought you know you're gonna die but you're thinking oh this works this this will be fine i can't possibly get hurt i'm looking at this website complete crewing you know and all these cities where they will they, there are plenty of companies out here doing that there's obviously a market for uh you know day laborers for, yeah but particularly, but this is like, you know, for productions. It's not like just just push a box. This is for, you know, like for, I'm just, I'm just Googling around. We offer intelligent, accurate, complete staffing solutions for unique production needs. In other words, complete crewing. You're a single source. You're labor experts. You know, we talk straight, no surprises. You know, there, so there's a lot of, obviously there's a market for this and there are people doing it. You know, I'm not sure which locals are Teamsters, but there is definitely a connection between the IA and the Teamsters. And by the way, they are up for uh, contract negotiations in July of this year. Um, so those other strikes that were just over um, are, you know, like they've got a six month period before it starts all over again. Here, listen to this, Ellen. So this is on Complete Crewing, they are a national organization. OSHA, 10-hour certification, ETCP certified, okay, and Event Safety Alliance. This, just check this, check this out. I mean, apparently this is going on. Maybe we're just not as aware of it as, I'll put this in the chat for you guys if you want to see. 
All right. Well, we know we work with all those organizations. The, um, as far as I know, the Event Safety Alliance does not offer any sort of certification or certificates or anything, but they do a lot of safety training. Um, they're a nonprofit organization run by Jim Digby. They do a safety, they have done in past years, a safety conference at Rock Lidditz in Pennsylvania. Right. Um, and have you ever heard of Complete Crewing, for example? Well, there's a lot of those sites that where people right. get jobs. Yep, yeah, a lot of them. Right. Well, I have the last question for the day. Nancy in Wyoming writes, how do I convince my employers I am ready to be a designer and not a technician? <laughs> well, you're, you're on your way. You have made the decision that you want to pursue design, that you've, you've reached a plateau in your work as in the technical aspects of theater. I think you're, you're actually in a good spot because you say my employers. I think you go to people who have trusted you to be uh, a programmer, or a follow spot operator, a master electrician, and say, I want to tackle a show and sit down and, and discuss it with them. That's, that's the only way you do it. They may not give you the biggest, hardest uh, musical known to man, but they might turn you loose on the odd couple to, to start building your design chops up. So I say you start with the people that you know and who know you to be a good a good hard worker and say, I'm ready for the move. How can we make this happen? What do you guys think? I think you should just, if that's your soul and that's what you need to do, I'm going to emphasize the word need to do. Um, then you got to, then I take Steve's advice, but just remember that designers are a very, very, very tiny sliver of our industry. There's a lot of people working, making money, doing a lot of things. Designers are, you know, population-wise, I don't know, maybe Ellen has some numbers, but of the, if you looked at the numbers of employees in the entertainment business, how many are designers relative to everything else in percentage? I don't know the answer, but I don't think it's huge. Well, so I don't it's, know it's, that I really know numbers, but, um, you know, obviously on a crew list for a concert tour, or a big show like Christine Aguilera that just opened in Vegas, um, there are, there are two hundred people involved. Well, let's that's on the whole thing. Let's say there's fifty people on the lighting team. One of them is the designer. Right. So that's so, a very very you know, small. Yes, but this person doesn't want to know what else they can do. This person wants to be a designer. So let's answer their question. Well, what is the question exactly? The question is, how do I convince employers I am now a designer, not a technician, or maybe an assistant? Stop, so stop I think tur turning down the technician work—that's the right, first step, right? And being, you know, a, a lot of it, I think, is like being in the right place at the right time. I mean, you heard Willie Williams on our recent interview with him. He actually called um, the Edge's mother at home. <laughs> um, having gotten her telephone number and saying, I want to work with your son. Is he home? You know, right. and then got to Bono. I mean, you know, uh, that's kind of like radical, but a lot of, a lot of the, a lot, you know, the designers, the directors may find them on LinkedIn, find them on Facebook, send them a note, you know, you have to be uh, pretty assertive. Yeah. You have to be right. Assertive. You know, get a hold of, uh, you know, sometimes like, like, this is just an example. Uh, let's say Steppenwolf sends out their preseason press release, and there's seven uh, productions listed, and not all of them have a lighting designer attached to them yet. So you could get a hold of the director and say, hey, you know, I've done 17 shows in Chicago so far um, as an assistant, or, you know, my first one is a sort of junior designer, and I'm ready for this, and, you know, can I work with you? And, you know, who knows? You have to let people know you're out there. That's true. Well, quite often on that stagehand crew thing, people will post on Facebook, hey, I'm moving to Long Beach, California. What kind of work is out there? And people are like, um, we're all looking for it. Go to the union, call the companies, you know, or if you're, you know, if you're in LA, call PRG, call Kinetic Lighting, call every company out there, you know, get a foot in the door. So, you know, who knows? Start with your community theater if you want to. Uh, do lighting and there's no other way in say yes to everything when you're young right but then again it does reach a, a fork in the road where if you keep taking technical work then people start to you know if you will um, type, you. typecast you right yeah yep. right that's what happens all right well 
The rocking sound of luminoids tells us that once again, you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on just about every podcast site out there. Check out our website at lighttalk.org and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However, if you were to decide to litigate us, the Snoop Group, who's gallivanting with David right now with the legal team of Sparks, Burnout, and Chase, will defend us until our retirement funds are completely depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers and Sister, coming to you from Gainesville, St. Parts, and the Lone Star State. And be sure to join us next week when we talk about more lighting shenanigans and serve you more of our casserole of nonsense. Light Talk, we're broadcasting questionable, extremely questionable, especially today, lumen knowledge and humor around the world. We'll see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Bye. Bye.